Let's right. start. Good afternoon, KubeCon. Welcome to what might be your last talk today. I assume Should so. Be. I there's, hope so. There's no other talks. Yeah. This is the last. Well, there's always the hallway track. That's so. true. That's very true. So, anyways, welcome. Uh, welcome to Minikube Status, where we go a little bit further than we went with the Minikube Start uh, talk earlier this week. Did anybody go to the, the, the intro session? All right, a handful okay. of you. Excellent. Um, well, shall we start? Yeah, um, I guess we will go through some of the initial things for those who uh, weren't in the intro session. So, for example, who we are. Uh, my name is Balint Pato. I work at Google uh, for the last year and a half now and, and started to work in the, uh, the container tools team uh, like three, four months ago. And uh, I'm leading the effort around Minikube and Scaffold, uh, so, and, and help out with Kaneko as well, time to time. And my name is Thomas Stromberg, and I, too, work for uh, Google. Uh, about three months ago, they offered to pay me to work on Minikube full time. So that's what I do now. Um, uh, and I also worked a little bit on Critis. <clears throat> so. All right, so uh, the agenda today is a, a quick architectural recap for those of you who did not attend the intro. Uh, a couple of feature demos for new things. Uh, a little talk about tinkering with Minikube, uh, depending on timing. Uh, plans for 2019, and we will leave time for questions. Uh, feel free to ask questions during or at the end. Yeah, we do want to have this one much more interactive than, than the intro was, so feel free to jump in, ask questions. Uh, we go as deep as we can in this 35 minutes, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, Let's this is more of a, a shallow dive than a deep dive, given the time constraints, but we'll do what we can. Um, so first, uh, we've had a lot of contributors over the years. Uh, I think it was 387 by the last count. It's 390 this oh, morning. Oh, 300, okay, Jesus. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you to the 13, or I don't know. Thank you to all the people who, uh, who have contributed, uh, especially the new ones. Um, yeah, uh, we couldn't do without you, so. Yeah. So uh, a quick architectural recap. Uh, so uh, what is Minikube? Um, well, I guess, how many of you have not used Minikube before? All right, so a couple. Um, so when you run Minikube start, uh, it's effectively uh, going through these different stages of setup. We've got a machine driver that sets up uh, a VM, uh, provisions a machine. Uh, in this case, it's KVM2. Um, but we also support a huge variety of other things. Uh, for instance, uh, VirtualBox, VMware Fusion, um, uh, Hyper-V, Hyper-Kit. Uh, so we provision a machine. And what's the first thing we do when we get on, onto a machine? Well, nowadays, we run kubeADM uh, to set up Kubernetes, uh, and we set Kubernetes up with real live released binaries, and it's a real normal released kubeADM. The idea with Minikube is once you get the VM provision and kubeADM is done, it's real Kubernetes. It's, there's not really any magic involved. Uh, there used to be a lot of hacky things in, uh, before kubeADM was involved, but uh, that's it for there. Um, so we also run a container runtime. Uh, by default, it's Docker. Here, I selected Cryo. We're going to actually do a little demo with Container D, uh, Container D and GVisor. Um, on top of that, we run Kubernetes. Uh, the default right now is v110. Uh, that is somewhat shameful to me because I really tried to make v112 the default, uh, and I failed because it was actually it was too slow to provision. So we backed it out uh, as the default. But we hope to do. I'd like to do v113 by the end of the year, uh, now that I think we got the performance kinks out. Um, so we also have a vast add-ons uh, marketplace, so as, you, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit. Um, so here, you know, I'm deploying Ingress, and then we have your app, uh, which is the whole reason you started on this long journey. So, so new feature demos. All right. So. I wanted to show uh, a very similar demo that I did in the intro, which was uh, running a couple of things on Minikube. So Minikube currently is up. Minikube status, you see that it's running. I started this Minikube instance with a little bit more complicated command. So let me show that. 
Yeah. So uh, we. So the reason why we're starting these before the demo is because Minikube does not work very well with poor connectivity, and we've had full of poor connectivity uh, here, unfortunately. Just didn't want to risk. Yes. Uh, no risk here. But. So this is the start command that I used. I used VM driver hyperkit. Um, I'm using a little bit larger disk size. And the container runtime is container D. So that's what uh, is running now uh, in the background. And uh, I'm going to start Minikube tunnel. Uh, so this is a new command that came in with the last release, 0 0.31. Uh, Point zero. I need to type in my password because Minikube Tunnel actually creates network routes into the the service cider, uh, so we can actually start to directly uh, address services that are that are running on the uh, on the cluster, and also Minikube Tunnel has a load balancer emulator. So if you you, you run something. Uh, let's deploy something. So kubectl run nginx uh, image nginx. So this will deploy a pod. You see that here I have uh, the kubectl get pod from all namespaces, and here I have services. Is it legible everywhere in the room? Is it large enough fonts? Uh, cool. Um, so nginx spun up. I'm going to expose this now. kubectl expose. Deployment nginx uh, type load balancer, and this is w what previously was not really working uh, in Minikube. You needed a cloud provider to to provision a, a load balancer and then inject the ingress uh, IP uh, into the the, the status uh, part of the the service. So as you can see, Minikube tunnel recognized that nginx is running. Picked it up and then it copies the the cluster IP into the external IP. So now you can use the same scripts you use you would use in in, in production um, to to get the external IP of, of your your uh, services and then you can uh, actually navigate to it and and it should work. There's there it is. Welcome to Nginx. Um, so, not yeah. I was going to say so to recap if you if you're not uh, specifying type equals load balancer. You don't need to run Minikube Tunnel, but one of the whole design goals around Minikube is high fidelity simulations of your production environment. And if your production environment's using load balancers, well, we're not really load balancing, but at least your scripts will still work. So, excellent. Um, another thing that I set up now is a little bit more involved, but I have. Uh, DNS setup, which is pointing to 10.96.0.10, which is kubedns's IP address. So my Mac host is going to resolve everything under the SVC cluster local uh, subdomain um, through this name server. So theoretically, I should be able to do reach this nginx server through nginx.default svc cluster local and there it is so excellent um, why this will be cool i'll uh, i'll show that when we are actually deploying another application uh, using uh, docker and scaffold another thing i wanted to show here what's running is add-ons so minikube add-ons list is how you list add-ons and then currently we have uh, the dashboard enabled, we have the add-on manager itself enabled as an add-on, uh, we have a registry enabled, and we have Gvisor enabled. So we can also see that registry is running here as a, as a, um, as a service and as a, uh, as a pod. We have uh, the Gvisor pod running here, making sure that the, the configuration is the right one and uh, so let's try this out. So what is Gvisor? Um, so Gvisor is a Google um, developed sandboxing technology that is basically, you can think about it as a user space implementation of uh, system calls uh, or, or kernel. So it creates a much uh, more secure uh, sandboxing technology for, for untrusted workloads. So if you have something like, uh, 
a multi-tenant setup or or uh, uh, workloads that you don't you can't really trust, then you can just annotate them with with an annotation like this, and then they're going to be uh, running in the Gvisor sandbox, uh, which is run as C. So let's see how this works. So if I say kubectl create dash f this untrusted .yaml, which is basically just another nginx, then should be created. The pod is created. Let's see if it's running. It is spun up. And then one way to test whether you're running in Gvisor is executing inside this uh, pod and uh, checking the, the syslog. Uh, so the reason why uh, th this is one way to do this, one other way could be to just PSing um, uh, within the uh, Minikube VM and then checking whether it's run as see the, the process that is running it. Uh, but uh, even that is not like the, the run as binary could be something else as well. So, so the recommended um, uh, way is to, to, to run this. Now, there is a bug currently which will throw an error message. So, so <laughs> we were the first one. This is so very this, new. Yeah, this add on was pushed on Monday. Yes. Uh, so, but the ah, second, there we got it. The second, the second run will, will succeed. Okay. Uh, and then you will see that it was actually starting Gvisor, and and then this is this is what you want to see when when uh, you have Gvisor with this. So, so if I run something similar on a on a non uh, Gvisor uh, workload, then it's it's a different a regular run C um, syslog. So that's a mini demo of uh, of the Gvisor add-on which you can just simply just turn on with Minikube add-ons, enable Gvisor. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. similarly, if, if you have add-ons, if you have a product where you think people will really use it in Minikube, um, or you know, random service that you would like to see tested and it's com complicated to set up, uh, the add-ons is basically a marketplace. So uh, feel free to send PRs to add your thing to the add-ons. Uh, right now, we don't have the best model as far as updating it between releases, but we hope to release often enough that it's not painful. So that will change. So another thing. So because registry is running now as, a, as an add-on, it is exposed as a service, I should be able to resolve uh, this uh, DNS name as well. So if I curl, I should just get an empty response, it's, it's working. So uh, one cool thing about this is that I can use now this registry uh, from my local Docker client to build images and push, push them uh, to this registry, which then container D itself can use to pull from. So there I'm cheating a little bit. Uh, there is a, this, this, something, this is something that I opened an issue uh, this week about um, that we should have in the container D config, we should have a, a, the insecure registry set up for, for the internal registry, and then this whole thing will work. Now it's set up currently, so, so uh, it will work. Uh, I just wanted to set the expectations. If you try it home tonight, this might not fully work yet. Um, all right, so let's do another test. So scaffold is uh, another uh, tool for local developer experience that, that we are developing. And um, it helps creating a continuous development workflow. So as, as you change your files, scaffold will rebuild your Docker images, uh, tag them, test them, push them to the uh, registry, and deploy the, the, the manifests that you specify in the scaffold YAML. Uh, it will deploy them to the current uh, kube CTL context uh, designated cluster. So currently in this project, I have two services, two artifacts that are being built. One is uh, for listing contributors from uh, the Minikube uh, GitHub project, and then a, a front end, which will generate that nice 
uh, slide that you saw about all the contributors of Minikube. So uh, these, these are here as, as two sub-projects. So this is a little Go uh, project that just builds the Go um, uh, program. And then the front end is um, a, a simple React.js uh, uh, project. I'm not a front end engineer, so it's going to be very simplistic. Uh, the code for this is in, in uh, github.com slash bubblepad slash contribual, so you can try this out. Um, so let's try to run this. So scaffold dev would just run this and, and, and try to do uh, the, the, the deployment and the pushing. Uh, now you can see that the images are defined as, as my repository. Uh, they're pointing to my, my registry in, in GCR. Uh, so I'm going to repoint scaffold to use the, the local registry inside Minikube as a, um, as, as a registry. So that's going to be the default repository. So it's going to rewire these artifact image names on top of this. So let's see how we deal with this. Another thing is that there's this warning. So this also, sh also shows that uh, we haven't really tested Scaffold yet with the with, uh, container D uh, Minikube setup. So Scaffold assumes that when you spin up Minikube, then there's going to be a Docker daemon inside of it, uh, which you can reuse. Uh, if container D is enabled, then um, the Docker uh, daemon is not going to be running. So uh, it is falling back to, to my local Docker daemon uh, which is running here. And by the way, that Docker daemon also has this registry set up as an insecure registry, just to have one more piece of the puzzle. Uh, and let's see what happens. So doc, uh, Docker build was done. Uh, it pushed. Most of the layers were already existent. And now we're building the second uh, uh, service, the front end service, which is a bit larger, so it takes a little bit of time to to send the build context to the Docker daemon. But after that, it should be relatively fast. We'll build it, push it, and then the Kubernetes manifests will be the, the, the next step to deploy. So in case of the front end, it's a service that exposes, uh, it's of type load balancer. So we'll, we should be able to see that as it pops up. Um, and the backend deployment part is, is, is just a simple pod with a replica of one. Uh, the backend is very similar. We have a service named SVC Contributors, listens on port 8000. And um, you can see that I prepared. I'm going to run this in uh, GVisor soon. Um, and then just a simple pod with a single container. Um, just how, to understand how the two services talk to each other, this guy, so the front end, is talking to the back end through this proxy. Uh, so it's referring to SVC contributor service via its, its uh, uh, DNS name. So that's how it talks, that's how these guys talk within the cluster to each other. Um, Excellent. So now the second push was done, and then the two uh, services and, and, and pods are created. And let's see what's happening. So on here, we, are, we see that we have the, the, the front end service, and we have the SVC contributor service. We have the, uh, the pods uh, as well deployed and happily running. So now, if I do front end, dot s default dot svc slash cluster local we should be able to see the wall of contributors for minikube so this is coming this is how fast the wi-fi is and uh, yeah so this is great so a couple of fancy things that scaffold does to to make uh, development easier is for example you can define some of the files that uh, Scaffold is watching automatically based on inspecting your Docker file. Uh, but some of them, so if you just change files in, in your, your, your directory, it will re-trigger the whole Docker build, re-tag, re-push, and redeploy. Uh, but you can 
mark some of them as, as syncable files, and then these files are not going to trigger a full rebuild. They're, they're just going to be synced into the pod, uh, the running pod directly. So let's let's do that, and and we'll see a quick change. So if I say hello, KubeCon, last presentation, awesome. So I hit save and it synced it, so it's already there. So if I alt tab, you can see that it's already uh, updated. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, and then let's do uh, just another test quickly. So if I change uh, a file that is defined as a, as a Kubernetes manifest, it's not gonna trigger rebuild either. It is only going to trigger the redeployment. So let's try that with the with the, the, the service contributor's backend, <clears throat> I'm gonna turn on the, the annotation for GVisor. Yeah, and this should generally just work the same way unless you're using a fancy syscall that GVisor doesn't support yet, uh, but that seems unlikely, especially for a web app. <clears throat> so it started up and uh, the logs are being pulled and it shows that everything is healthy, so if I just refresh, it's still working-ish, okay. And then now we can do our test whether really we are running in GVisor or not. So if we are going to try this guy, this is the pod, exec into it, run D message, okay, this is expected, <coughs> another expected, and there it is. Yay. So it is, it is running in GVisor now. So, uh, why do we do this? Why do we? Why did we put GVisor into into Minikube? Um, so the idea is that GVisor is going to be part of uh, GKE. I think the GKE Alpha uh, it's, it's an alpha feature in GKE currently. So uh, sooner or later, this will be a thing that you want to run in your GKE clusters. So it is very beneficial to be able to try that out uh, in your local environment and test it first and not get surprised in, in, uh, in a GKE cluster first. So that's the idea. So try it out, play with it, uh, provide feedback on, on, on the GVisor um, uh, project or the Miniq project, depends on where it breaks. Um, and uh, yeah, help us improve it. Yep. So, so Miniq aims for uh, very cheap experimentation uh, so that you don't have to pay us money uh, if it fails. Uh, we'd like you to pay us money anyways, but you know. Uh, we'd like to get money for success, not failure. So, uh, so. Excellent. Right. I'm I'm done with the demos. We still have time. Yeah, we've got time. So, cool. <clears throat> so, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, plans that uh, plans for 2019, uh, and with with the uh, caveat this this is all fungible. I mean, this is based on the community. Uh, so. The plans are basically whatever we and what we vote on as a community or as developers. Um, so these these were uh, we haven't actually like written up our roadmap externally yet for 2019. We haven't, uh, but we've been starting the discussion this last week. And here's a couple of things that we've come up with in talking with people. Um, so one of my my personal pet peeves is that Minikube is too damn hard for too damn many people. Um, there are a lot of situations where it breaks. I mean, if you're already a Kubernetes developer, you know, you can probably figure your way out through it. But for a lot of people, uh, actually roughly 20% of people, uh, based on a survey we did, uh, Minikube is how they learn Kubernetes. And if your first experience with Kubernetes is a bad one, well, that's, you know, really terrible for the community. Um, so we would like to do a single step installer, um, uh, which means, you know, the idea of bundling VM drivers uh, or auto-selecting which VM uh, to use. You know, if you've already got a machine with VMware Fusion, we shouldn't, you know, we should just, Minikube start should just work uh, without any kind of options, basically. Uh, we'd like clear end user documentation uh, and help is definitely wanted here. Uh, right now the Minikube website is very code-centric and it's not very user-centric. and. Some of our documentation is on one Kubernetes IO website and some is on our GitHub and you know, it's, 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 it's a bad situation. Uh, we'd also like to stop asking people to delete the Minikube folder when things go wrong. Um, that's definitely a facepalm moment. Uh, we'd like to make it easy to debug. 
Um, and I don't know if you want to talk Yeah. About so one of the things is that so Minikube is not that complicated, seemingly, because it, it's just a VM plus cube admin. Uh, however, there is a lot of things that can break. So, uh, and a lot of times people just see that things are hanging or, or, or slow or not working. So uh, it, is, it is actually hard to, to pinpoint and, and it requires a lot of uh, back and forth on, on the GitHub issues as well to, to nail down what the actual issue is. So uh, we, want, we really want, think that it would be very beneficial to make this, make this whole experience better, to, to make it easier to debug, to, to pinpoint where the issue is, have better health checks, better pre-flight checks. If I made a mistake and I have to wait 15 minutes to, to learn that I made a mistake and that's why it's not running and I have to go through again a 15 minute uh, thing to try it out, that's a bad feedback loop. We want to make that faster. Uh, clear, actionable error messages, and, and just better debugging experience in general. Yeah. Um, and we would also really like to be much more inclusive. Uh, who you see on stage is not necessarily who the users are. We, we don't represent all of our users. We, you know, we're a handful of maintainers, uh, and unfortunately a handful of maintainers pigeonholed into countries that have really great connectivity, uh, and not all of our users do. And so I think Minikube, suffers for those users. Um, so this one of the things I called out here is I'd really like Minikube to be offline friendly. Uh, if it was offline friendly, we would have shown Minikube start at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and help is definitely wanted there. Um, and and uh, yeah, efficient open source governance. I, I, I put this down because I think that uh, Minikube was a little bit um, of a really grassroots uh, just quickly get something done uh, in, in mid-2016 uh, type of project and, and there is not much thought put into yet like how to make this a, a self-sustaining project in terms of the community. So this is new for us though. So we really want help and, and from the community we will ask it on the C cluster lifecycle uh, uh, meetup group uh, uh, group as well on the, on the meetings uh, to, to help us in, in defining how are we prioritizing things, how are we going to involve other people, how is it going to be a, a, a really self-sustaining project that is a, we believe is a key piece uh, in, the, in the whole ecosystem um, to, to be a, a free, open, local uh, experience for Kubernetes. So. Um, that's another thing that in 2019 I would definitely like to, to, to see to have a larger set of maintainers who have a clearer process in terms of communicating priorities and putting this roadmap together uh, so it's not just us uh, making up stuff. Yeah. So a couple more plans as I stand freezing under this blower that's over my head. I'm going to take I this over. <laughs> um, so, uh, we, we definitely plan to continue our investment in CI. Uh, I've spent actually most of my time as a Minikube developer fighting the CI. Um, I would like to stop doing that. Uh, part of it is we're migrating to Prow uh, in the coming quarter. Uh, we've spent a lot of time developing tooling around CI, managing our flaky tests, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Um, one thing uh, I would also like to see is more performance work happening. Uh, I would like Minikube provisioning to be drastically faster than it is, uh, and I would also like it if my MacBook Pro didn't burn me in the lap when I was using Minikube. Um, so there's a couple of ideas here. Uh, help is definitely wanted um, on all of these items. Uh, and there's been uh, some discussion this week around multi-node. Uh, we avoided it for a long time because uh, it wasn't really in our original charter, people weren't really thinking about it, but um, the Kubernetes is a lot, uh, has a lot more going on now than it did two years ago, uh, and like HA workloads and things like that, where people would want to have multiple nodes to run their simulations. Uh, so PRs are definitely welcome on that, uh, and in general, you know, help is wanted. Um, so let's build something beautiful together. Um, it's not just code that we need help with, uh, we, we really need help with documentation. Uh, Project management, uh, I, I am not good at that, so. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, so if you wanna get started, uh, you can look for issues. We've been tagging some of the issues with help wanted and good first issue, and sometimes both. 
Um, we just created a developer's mailing list, uh, minikube-dev. Uh, don't be surprised if you go there and see no emails, because I, we literally just created it. Um, there's also an analogous users group. Um, uh, we are pretty active on the Minikube channel on Slack. Um, we also have an hour, uh, office hours uh, bi-weekly. Uh, I put a link there to our office hours notes uh, that we take. Um, so that, that might be a little bit confusing that it's 9 a.m. And, and 5 p.m. PST, so we don't meet twice the same day. It's, uh, right, right. it's alternating every yeah. other week, so. Yeah, so a lot of our developers, uh, a lot, or you know, especially our developers who work on Minishift, which is a fork of Minikube, uh, are in Asia, so we try to run in both time zones to be friendly for everyone. Um, we have a survey here, uh, and we would love to get more feedback. Uh, it's a five question survey, so it's not gonna take a lot of time. We basically wanna know why people are using Minikube and what we could be doing better. Uh, and then Twitter handles if you just wanna harass us after this, so. Uh, so questions now, I will walk around with the mic. Anyone? Anyone have questions? I'll let you answer since you're here. Okay. <laughs> so, when, so when you're working on add-ons, how difficult is it to create add-ons in this work? Especially like, like I'm looking at adding, um, thinking about adding Kata okay. um, add-on for it, but what would be the kind of work involved to have that happen because Kata comes with the... So an add-on is not that hard. There is actually a... Um, a description as well, how to add an add-on. Um, there's an MD here somewhere. So I think there's uh, uh, adding an add-on. There it is. Okay. There might be a better view for this. <laughs> so there's a description here. But it should be relatively easy. Let me just show you an add-on. So uh, for example, the registry yeah, I, don't, I, I was, think GVisor actually might be the most relevant in this one, if we can show it. It's complicated, though, but... Right. Yeah, that, and that's where things get a little strange. Is so with GVisor, what we do is, is so this pod is gets deployed, and then this pod is, is uh, it actually has the code here as well. Um, and then we have the, the GVisor code here, disable and enable, and these are the, the things that get executed. So basically, this does all the setup, downloads the, the necessary binaries for, for the container dshim, run sc, sets it up, and then, uh, so this, this is the pod that, that basically gets uh, executed. So as soon as you have that um, uh, wired up, then this, folder under add-ons is what you need to create to, to uh, be compliant with the other add-ons. And uh, then there's uh, another part here which has the assets defined. So this is a generated file that gets generated from this add-ons.go. So uh, this is where you define, like let's see the, where the GVisor is. Uh, things are weird. So here it is. So it basically just lists all the the, the files that, that are required in the, uh, for the add-on to be deployed. Um, and then these are, uh, get basically added into um, binary data inside the, the Minikube uh, binary itself. So when you run Minikube add-ons enable, then it will copy these uh, files um, from the binary itself and, and run kubectl create on them. Um, so the concept is pretty simple. You just have to have these bunch of files that you want to create uh, and in, the, in, the, in the folder. Uh, if you need some code for that to be built, then you can, you can add that into, into the code uh, here as well. So yeah. it's, it, it, it's pretty simple and self-contained. Yeah, I, for most people uh, making an add-on uh, it's actually pretty trivial, but since this one is basically like replacing the engine while it's in flight, uh, yeah. things get a little bit more complicated when you start messing with yeah. the container runtime. And so we had this question ourselves a couple of weeks ago. And 
yeah, th- look at the G visor because because we we were like, c- can we do this in an add-on? And well, yeah. the answer is yes. So. The answer is yes. This one is actually a uh, super privileged. Yeah, don't run this on a, on a production cluster. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, questions. Um, so some of our applications, you know, are approaching tens of thousands of lines of code, and doing a rebuild is just not tenable for a lot of our developers. Um, you can't wait a minute. Is there any interest in adding like a sync rebuild command? So if we sync a directory, rather than actually rebuilding the command, just issuing you know a go dep go build within the container after a file is synced. Would that be something so that would in? be within scaffold? Scaffold. Yeah. Um, yeah, raise the PR. We are interested in everything uh, performance related there. So uh, we are looking into to to go deeper and and have have tailored experience for language communities uh, to make make uh, development faster. So that that is what scaffold is about. So uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That sounds sounds like an interesting uh, way to speed that up. So, if you wanted to do this outside of Scaffold, so Minikube does support uh, mounts, but I've also heard people running sync thing uh, between pods and their workstations, uh, which sounds crazy, but you know, whatever works. So. Yeah, it would be definitely nice to to create native tooling around uh, like built-in tooling, so you can you can do these things uh, somewhat manual. Uh, and script it up. Could you talk to what you see as the big rocks for enabling the offline uh, install? I think that needs a bit more analysis on our end to to actually to, to map those rocks out. Uh, one of the trivial things, I think that there's a pause container that always gets still downloaded, even though that needs to be cached, should be cached, but it, for some reason it always wants to download it. Uh, there's not that many um, issues. So as soon as you uh, spun up thing, I, I feel like that the, for some reason the API server has some something as well. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I was experimenting with it, but I have I don't have full answer to that yet. Yeah, there shouldn't be that many. Yeah, some. Uh, I know yeah. the guys at Red Hat have written up some document on like how do you hack Minikube to be offline. Uh, where I would like to go with this is that the first time you run Minikube, that it you know download it caches everything, uh, and that so subsequent runs you don't you just it works by default. That's where I'd like to aim. So I work in high compliance environments where they don't have internet access from their development machines. So even if we could just point to like a local registry or something, um, and just pass that in via environment variable, that might be a okay. Okay, awesome. Um, I just wanted to share uh, more of a comment. Uh, so when I started my journey with Kubernetes, of course my first uh, go-to thing was Minikube, but I feel like the rocket you shared, the user space being pretty small, the moment we put even something bigger than uh, Nginx container, it starts crashing and there are, so, so then the person who's trying to containerize or uh, write specs is confused. Am I getting errors with my local Kubernetes setup or is it a basically, so basically that naturally moved me away from Minikube to use kubeadm or, and all I was trying to do was set up a Jenkins container and run a bunch of hello world echo statements, but even then it doesn't scale. So if we can do something around that, that will be really useful. And of course I want to support uh, the gentleman's uh, comment before where every time I don't, uh, if I delete uh, rm-rf home directory dot minikube, we can just 
have that ISO lying somewhere else, which is what we want to do and not download it again. Yes, it was absolutely. pretty painful. I did that here twice. <laughs> so I'm just sharing that, it's especially <laughs> if you're in between places and not on your home or <laughs> your work. Yes. So you don't want to do that again. Absolutely. These are real problems. And, and I think that the, the Jenkins issue that you're uh, referring to is, is related to easier debuggability. Like, in, in case you, you want to run a bigger application that fits into the default sized Minikube VM, you should have sensible errors that are actionable and say that, hey, your pods are getting evicted because you're causing this pressure. Uh, you shouldn't have to go into uh, journal CTL uh, on the kubelet logs and then try to, to parse it out yourself what's happening. Uh, by the way, I was running it on my MacBook, so I'm in a complete, like that was even worse to debug, so. I have basically gave up. Yeah. Uh, one last comment. Uh, I know you mentioned you need help with all the stuff you said. Uh, how do we get started? Great question. So reach out. Uh, we will. We are available uh, on Slack, on, on the, the public meetings as well. Come, uh, let's have a discussion. Let's brainstorm. Um, look at the issues as well. There's, there's like a bunch of issues outstanding. Uh, Probably someone else already ran into the issue that, that you ran into. We have a pretty large user base. So uh, if you find a, a relevant discussion, you can join in, say that you want to help out, ask, ask if, you, if you create a PR, like, would, would it be OK? And then, um, or just do it, and then, and then, and then we'll, we'll start a discussion there. So just go in there, download the, the code base, make out slash minikube single command. It just like makes it so it's relatively easy to get started and start tinkering around with it. So, um, um, yeah, I think that this this does this answer your question. Yes. Cool. And your machine just kernel panics. <laughs> <laughs> Did it? Uh, other questions. It did. <laughs> It says right. that it's done. Wow. Um, F yeah. Feel free to bump my question after because it's kind of specific. But I'm trying to get mm, Minikube running on a Linux machine. And since I'm already using a bunch of stuff with KVM, I'm trying to stay out of VirtualBox yeah. or VMware, et cetera. And so my understanding was that I have to use a Docker machine driver that's going to use VRSH for the network part. I kind of went into a wild goose chase on that, and I was kind of wondering, is there, is that kind of officially supported, and where would you, what, what are the keywords I should Google for in the repo and everything to get me started on the right track? Knowing that I'm comfortable with KVM and stuff, I already have a bunch of KVM machines running, um, so I'm, I'm trying to just get into the right direction. So let's rephrase it again, because I was a little bit distracted by my <laughs> kernel <laughs> panic. So, so you have a KVM, and then you want to? I, I have KVM. I'm comfortable with KVM. I'm running a few custom boxes with KVM. I'm also kind of comfortable with Cube. Like, I, I got a little control plane running in one of these KVM things. But I would like to get all the goodness of Minikube. And I'm trying to figure out how to make that work together. KVM2. <laughs> yeah, so we have the KVM2 driver. I yeah. wonder if you try that out. Okay. It, it, it required me to get uh, libvert stuff, I think. Oh, I see. And yeah. then that's when things got open. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the KVM2 driver does use libvert right now. Um, and it should just work if you install the package. I have heard complaints that Arch Linux was just switched to shipping with a libvert that doesn't work, um, like 4.9 or something. But I actually use, like, KVM2 is my main uh, usage for Minikube. So it's uh, where not only do we test it every hour, but uh, I, t I use it all the time. Um, but let's, I would say, open an issue uh, for what's not working, and we'll, we can solve it together. Thanks. All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll Thanks be so sticking around here if you have extended questions. Thank you, everyone.